Be like-minded. We find that Paul was constantly preaching unity for the churches so that they could grow together in like mind and become as God and Christ are alike in mind. You know, he reminded the churches in his letters that Christ and God are one. It's something that we've been hearing a lot about recently. We also find the analogy of the church being an extension of Christ is made time and time again. It is mentioned that he is like the body of the church. And so we are part of that body. We each have a role in helping to support the different parts of the body. This is something constant that is played out through the Bible. And so we see that there is no room for division within the body of Christ. Only the constant need to grow more and more in God's ways so we can learn to better serve each other as is fitting. But there is this thing called human nature. And human nature says, you need to take care of you. You are the most important person. Yes, you love other people, but they come in second to you. Your thoughts, your desires, your needs are the most important, and they should come first. But this is not what Paul taught, and it's not how he lived his life. If you will, let's look at Philippians 2, and beginning in verse 1. Philippians 2, and beginning in verse 1, or we read to verse 8, it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, and having the same love being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. So we see there's no room for selfishness here, but rather an ongoing outward concern for the welfare of others. It's not wrong to look out for our own interests, but it should not be 100% of our attention or our thought pattern. Instead, we should be attempting to do the most we can for each other. We, we read Christ's approach because it was God's will that he humbled himself for each of us, for each and every person that has ever lived or will live. If you will, let's also drop down to verse 13. We'll read to verse 17. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his, for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Hold fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So we find God works within us 
if we are willing to do his will and his pleasure. And we see that's why Paul was happy to serve, to help build others up, to encourage them, to give them instruction on how to keep moving forward so that they too could attain the eternal gift. And so God is asking each of us, what are you going to do? Here is life. Walk in it. Show me by your actions what you're going to do. Choosing every day to be like-minded with God and others. It takes constant care and attention. It takes godly wisdom and understanding to be able to actually pull this off. You know, it's so easy to drift into thinking about yourself. How unfair things are and all other kinds of self-intoxicating thoughts. So the first thing that we have to be cognizant of is that we must be in close proximity in our minds to God. If we're not having a spiritual relationship with God and all that that entails, then we will not be able to have that fellowship with our brothers and sisters. And secondly, we have to put into action what we believe. Otherwise, it's just theoretical, pretty, but with no substance. It's like James says, we look into a mirror, we see what type of people we are, and then once we leave this proverbial mirror, we return to what we were. But how is that growing? It's not. Let's look at 1 Peter 4. Actually, I'll just reference this. In 1 Peter 4 and verses 8 and 9, Peter commands that we have fervent love for one another. He says, because in so doing, this fervent love covers a multitude of sins. Also in Proverbs 10 and verse 12, it says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers over all wrongs. You know, it's so easy to get mad and frustrated with someone else, to blow up over small things. How do I know this? Well, it happens to me. That's part of the reason why I'm talking about this subject. Because it's an area that all of us can grow in. You know, we cannot read each other's brains or hearts. So we have to rely on external cues. You know, if it's our instinct to fly off the handle at the drop of a hat, then love is not truly in our lives. And we are definitely not being like-minded. Let's read 1 Peter 3, verses 8 to 12. Peter's the book that always likes to hide from me. 1 Peter 3, and beginning in verse 8, says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. Not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Four. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now Peter here is calling us to remain level-headed to be compassionate, to be tender-hearted, to be courteous, not allowing our minds to reach the point where we return evil for evil. Now that choice is up to 
each and every one of us in every situation that we encounter. But more importantly, he is telling us that we are called to do this. This is part of our calling. That's how importantly God views this. So then it's truly a mindset. And the authors of the Bible, being divinely inspired by God, wrote about this time and time again because of the gravity of the subject. I'm going to read Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 3, and then verses 12 to 16, but I'm going to read it from the NIV. Ephesians 4, and beginning in verse 1 to 3. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. And then dropping down to verse 12. To equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and then in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. These scriptures speak of unity and maturity. But you have to have unity and peace so that you continue, can continue to grow in maturity. Now, godly maturity takes all these actions into account, and then it acts upon them. Also, I'm going to read verses 17 to 31 because I think it rounds out the thought that Paul started to introduce here. So starting in verse 17, continuing on with the NIV. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you no longer live as Gentiles do in the fertility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life that you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. 
So brethren, this takes work on each of our parts. We cannot allow Satan to get a foothold on our attitudes. We have to remember that we are here for a different purpose. Being made new in our minds to follow after true godly love as well as care and concern for each other. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 3 and 4 that we have to be on guard, standing firm in the faith, being courageous and strong, doing everything in love. That is the only way that we can accomplish these things. So to become like-minded really means putting on true godly love. Embracing it, learning how to use it with, again, all wisdom and understanding. Again, it takes constant care, as we have seen. It takes forethought and meditation to think about how we act and treat each other in all situations. Because in the end, it's our choice. So I'd like to leave us today with this thought. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul speaks about the greatest gift. And he points out that love is the most powerful thing. In verses 1 to 3, he points out very strongly that people may have different gifts from God. Speaking in tongues, prophecy, ability to understand mysteries and have knowledge. Maybe they have faith enough to move mountains. Maybe they do good and charitable deeds. But it means nothing if it is not done out of a true godly love. So for the last scripture, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 13, and we'll read verses 4 to 7. First Corinthians 13 and beginning of verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked and thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in an iniquity but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Brethren, that is our charter. We have to be able to do this, to become like-minded with God and with each other.